going on, everyone? This is the My Aggie Nation podcast. I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle and MyAggieNation.com. It's a little different today. Good old Zach Taylor, my buddy Zach Taylor from WTAW, he's, he's off. He's gallivanting around in this winter wonderland that we're having. So I, I brought in an, an, an able sub, the, the, the number two on the depth chart. That is the Eagles, Alex Miller. What's going on, Alex? Not a lot, Travis. Just uh, enjoying this Thursday afternoon. Uh, guess I'm subbing in as your quality control analyst. I've been promoted to assistant coach. There you go, as Buzz Williams wants you to be. Um, <laughs> well, okay, before we talk about like sports and stuff, we should talk about your true passion, and that is what you had to cover today. You you went and like interviewed someone about meat. Yes, yes, and this is sports related because I'm currently shameless plug. I'm currently working on a series of short stories for our Brazos 360 magazine, which will be coming out in March, and it's titled uh, Five Small Town Restaurants to Go Check Out in the Brazos Valley." And basically, it's uh, based off my travels covering high school football last fall. And you know, I went to a lot of the smaller schools, and when I went to the small towns. I'd try and go to a local restaurant instead of you know McDonald's or Sonic or Whataburger and found some really good places along the way and so today I was uh, up in Hearn at Penny's Diner they're a 50s style diner serving up breakfast lunch and dinner 24 hours a day and uh, after that I went down to Whitehall about 10 miles southeast of Navasota and uh, was at the Whitehall Cafe they opened last April or May excuse me uh, right after COVID hit and uh they, they're open Thursday through Sunday, and they serve uh, a lot of barbecue and home-cooked meals. It's just the, it's literally the mom-and-pop shop, and today was cool because uh, Thursdays they do their steak special, and so I literally got to watch Don, the owner, just cut a big slab of beef into 12-ounce steaks, which was fun, and you know it's really cold outside, and so he's trying to work his smoker up to temperature, and so messed around a little bit with fire and our photographer Cassie Stricker came along and so yeah be on the look for that nothing gets Alex more excited than raw meat for those (laughs) of you who are listening and and don't know Alex very well that being said I would like to say that there's a lot going on in the world of Aggie sports right now but but there really there really isn't um men's basketball had their fourth consecutive game postponed due to COVID positives within the the program. And we'll probably get into talking about them here in a little bit. I mean, softball does start up this weekend. It's going to be cold. Baseball is supposed to have their leadoff event as they get ready for their season in two weekends. Um, And that was canceled. The the, the leadoff event was canceled for this weekend due to inclement weather. Um, Just not, not a whole lot going on right now. That being said, though, Zach Taylor and I, since we spent most of last week's podcast talking about the NCAA fourteen or NCAA college football game that that uh, EA Sports announced they're going to be bringing back and breaking all that down, and a little bit on men's basketball, we didn't really touch that much on the the second national signing day of the year that happened in the first week of February. And Alex follows that stuff closely for us here at the Eagle. Um, let's just start from from the general perspective from the 35,000 foot view Alex what was your overall take of the signing class that finished at least according to 247 sports.com as the number seventh in the country yeah I mean it, it was a really good class for a um, you know they really did a number on the O-line and the D-line and they really did a number in the city of Houston I mean you look up and down the list um, you know the enrollees they to, to me say Adelia who was originally an Ohio State commit you know, they got Shadrach Banks, who's a fringe top 100 player. First guy from North Shore High School that a and signed since 2000, which is just nuts. And then, you know, you look at guys that aren't enrolled yet. You got LJ Johnson. He's a borderline five-star running back. You know, he was kind of the big prize of the second signing day, per se. And then, you know, Bryce Foster, another fringe uh, five-star player who is a top 100 recruit nationally. You know, A&M winning that battle over Oklahoma was big. You know, you, you look at what A&M's trying to build under Jimbo Fisher, and it, it all starts it all starts on the O-line and the D-line. And A&M really put an emphasis to that. And, 
you know, Josh Henson did a really good job recruiting guys on the O-line. You look at Ruben Fothery, guy 6'8 out of Richmond Foster. And then what what Elijah Robinson and Terry Price were able to do on the D-line, Shamar Turner, five-star guy. He's number 21 player nationally out of DeSoto. You know, I don't, I don't know if you know this, Travis, but a and has a pretty – uh, good good history with defensive players from DeSoto, hint, hint, Von Miller, future NFL Hall of Famer. And so, uh, in, you know, they, they did really well in state, but they also went nationwide. You know, they get a guy like Elijah Judy, who was committed to Georgia for a long time. Um, they go out, they get, they get top player in Oklahoma with Kendall Daniels. They hit Miami and get a couple of guys. They even go to Baton Rouge and get a guy, Jordan Gilbert, a safety. So, you know, Jimbo Jimbo seems to be his his deal is inside out recruiting. And that's what AM did again. And uh, you know, it it seems like they've still got one one spot left in their class. And so I'm curious to see what they what they do with that. You know, maybe they hit the transfer portal. Uh we've already seen them kind of do that. You know, they signed the the JUCO offensive lineman from Australia who announced at 2 a.m. Central time. And uh, they've which got... Which you were awake for. Which I was awake for. Not not intentionally. Uh, oh, got into right. a game of... Got into an intense game of dominoes with the roommates and just so happened to be up that late. And so I figured, might as well see if this guy commits to A&M or not. And then, you know, on the O-line, they got a transfer from Tennessee, Jameer Johnson, who he, he previously started for the volunteers and so you know when you when you when you look at where AM needs to rebuild next year o-line is definitely of utmost priority and so getting a guy like jameer johnson with sec experience he's 6'5 300 you know he plays tackle you know assuming that Kenyon green is going to move out to left tackle maybe maybe jameer johnson's a guy that you kind of shoe in as the right tackle and you know, you build your interior guys from within, and we know how we know how important tackle positions are. So, you know, a and did a pretty good job. They had, they pretty much addressed all of their needs, and uh, I'd say it was a pretty successful signing class for the Aggies. When you talk about DeSoto and Texas A and M, you can't figure uh, forget about Cyrus Gray. Oh, absolutely, Cyrus. Cy- I mean... Cy- Cyrus Gray was an incredible running back. It was also, I believe, on the cover of uh, of Dave Campbell's Texas Football. I think you're right. I think I think I I know I'm right. What are you talking about? So yeah, I, I think that is interesting, and and that is something that has kind of caught my attention as we kind of shift away from. Yes, there was a a, a pretty solid recruiting class from A and M. I think you uh, um, hit it right on the head with um, the fact that Jimbo Fisher starts in the trenches. Um, and so offensive line, defensive line, that's where he really tries to focus in a lot of his um, recruiting and making sure that that is where A&M's attention and focus is a lot of times. That one spot that's left, and you bring up the transfer portal, that, that's, that's a really interesting concept talking around with a lot of things that are going, or going on in college football. The potential for a vote on giving every college athlete a one-time free transfer uh, in the future, that that's on the uh, fringe. There was a story out in SI last week by the great Ross Dellinger, who is a, a friend of the podcast we've on, had on here a couple times, talking about just what's going on in the transfer portal, how that, it, it, according to their his his um story, that there is about 1,500 players in the transfer portal right now, which is more than double what it was in and that was just since August and that was more than double what it was from the August to August prior the year prior um because of what's going on with COVID because of the ability of these players to have an extra year because of COVID um with looking at how only the senior class that is graduating this year or or coming in this year will will not count towards the total number of scholarships but once you get past that you're going to have only have those 85 scholarships available each year and um that they basically have a, a freshman class of 50 people right now um the the interesting point also of the story that looked ahead at um how coaches will frame the 25 scholars the 25 new signings that they get each year how many of those are going to go to high school players to juco players coming in and how many of those are going to be saved simply for 
free agency in the transfer portal. What do you think, uh, Alex? Do you think that the transfer portal is going to have much more of an effect on how these signing classes are framed each year? Or do you think that um, the it'll still kind of say the same and a lot of these players who try to test the water in the transfer portal might be uh, out of luck when it comes to landing at a new school and, and getting another scholarship, even continuing their college career, both um, athletically and academically. Yeah, I definitely think that the next few years in college football is going to be a very interesting case study of how roster management is done. Um, you know, Ross had a terrific story. I had a chance to read it and, you know, the lead guy in his story was Manny Heatherly, a guy mm-hmm. from Crosby, and one time A and M commit, I believe. And you know, he he went to LSU, he entered the transfer portal, and landed nowhere. And now he's working as a FedEx worker, and he has a daughter, and is providing for his family. You know, you look at A and M guys like Jeremiah Martin, Dalen Wright, even Connor Blumrick. Um, you know, they entered the transfer portal, and they have landed at Power Five schools. Jeremiah Martin's going to Washington, Dalen's going to. Minnesota and Connor's headed to Virginia Tech. So for guys like that, it's working out. But it's so interesting how, and Ross made a really good point of his story of, you know, there are too many guys in the portal and just not enough spot. And when you factor in these super freshman classes, it, it really puts a lot of talented players in a pickle in a bind where, you know, they're talented enough to play at a Power 5 school, but the spots aren't there. And it's, and it's going to be a shame to see guys who – you know, maybe they jump ship too early, you know, they, they're, they're freshmen and they don't get to play as much. And, you know, their, their first instinct is, well, I'll go play somewhere else. And it, and it never works out for them. And so, you know, I I really hope that doesn't become a thing. And, you know, on the flip side, I think it was Andy Staples that, you know, when you're, when you're talking about the, the opposite of the, the roster management look, Two, two, three hours down the road, what former A&M offensive coordinator Jake Spavital is experimenting with at Texas State down in San Marcos. And you look at their 2021 signing class, there's not a single high school player. And, you know, Andy got a chance to talk with Coach Spav, and, you know, Spav was pretty straightforward. Like, we have 50 freshmen. Like, there's so many of them. And, I think I don't I don't remember how many guys they ended up signing. I think it was only like eleven or twelve. But I mean, it, it's all transfer portal. It's all JUCO guys. They're trying to fill in the classes above them. And so yeah, it's interesting how a school like Texas State is literally just going after that transfer portal, that JUCO market, and they're not even trying to get the leftovers of what the a and and the Texas and the Houston's and the TCU's and the Baylor's of the world are, are not picking from. And, you know, this had, and I think also in that story, Spav mentioned, you know, this has been such a weird year because the evaluations have been off. And, um, you know, I think that that's something coaches are hoping opens back up this spring is they can go to campuses and visit and they can have recruits come to school, you know, COVID willing, you know, we'll see how that all shakes out. But I mean, that's, that's also been something that's been interesting of how COVID has totally shut down the recruiting process. And, you know, it's going to be interesting three, four years later, how kind of these somewhat blind evaluations pan out. Um, I think it was Joe Hoyt up at the Dallas Morning News was talking with I think it was the cedar hill coach and he was like you know we've got probably 20 guys that would normally sign to play college football and they only ended up having 10 or 11 that signed to go play at the next level and so guys are being overlooked um coaches are making drastic changes to the way that they're ma- comprising their rosters and uh you know guys are kind of jumping ship and look maybe a little too early is and you know, it, it, it's it's going to become free agency with college football. And, you know, it, it could be a thing where, you know, maybe there's some shadiness going behind and guy, guy wants out and school's like, hey, you interested? And before he even transfers, maybe he's got something lined up. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see the ramifications of, you know, the COVID plus the extra year of eligibility 
plus the instant transfer market all combined at once. I think it's going to be a chaotic next four or five years roster management wise of college football. Sure. And I'm really actually kind of curious on the effects with uh, the junior college because junior college was always the place that coaches went when they needed that little bit of experience, when they might have had a little bit of, hole because, of a hole because of a transfer or uh, maybe a medical um, a retiree or, or something like that where they just needed that little touch of experience in there to go along with the development of the younger guys coming in. Well, now with the transfer portal, you might be able to find that little bit of experience from a group of five player, which sometimes might just be a little bit of a step above um what you see at the JUCO level. Will those JUCO players still have as much of a market um, to jump into group of five and then especially power five schools moving forward? Um, that, that's that's going to be really interesting as well because I, I think this free agency thing is, is kind of here to stay for better or for worse. Um, and especially if they add in the, the freebie of a free transfer where you don't have to sit out a year, that transfer portal is going to be overflowing with players. And unless you unless you know that you have somewhere to land beforehand, that that uh, you, you have an idea that someone might be interested in you, then you're taking a big risk right now because there's not, there's not enough spots right now for people that there's in the transfer portal and it's only going to get worse. That being said, let's move on to uh, some other things going on. Uh, like I said, uh, a and softball starts up this weekend. It's going to be an icy, frigid uh, weekend, and that's just kind of how it always seems to start out with a and softball. So if you're uh, going to go out there, bundle up. Um, what isn't happening this weekend, like we mentioned earlier, is Texas A&M basketball. For basically two straight weeks now, what amounts to four SEC games, They've had to sit it out. They uh, had COVID positives on February 2nd, and uh, they shut down all operations in, the, uh, in the, 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 depart- the whole department. They're just trying to test and get everyone back healthy. Um, at last we heard on Buzz Williams' radio show on Monday, he said that uh, the, weekend of, the week of the 2nd, where that was the week that they shut everything down, uh, A&M uh, had multiple players with multiple positive tests every day. Uh, And then that Sunday's test, which they received the results back on Monday, was the first time that that group of players that was tested all came out negative. Now, they're not testing everyone every day all at the same time to keep um, different player groups away from each other. So, for instance, um, the players who have been infected, they're kind of in one testing group. The players who hadn't been affected, they're in another testing group. The players who... uh, uh, got a negative test back after they were infected and have to go through the heart screening protocols that were mandated by the SEC earlier last fall, they're kind of shifted into another group. And so all those groups are tested at different times as to kind of keep everyone separated from each other to try to mitigate the spread of uh, this virus. So the testing group that came in on Sunday tested negative, but because they've had two more games canceled since then, it, it, it's evident that the problem is still uh, rampant in the, in the program. Now, it, what's interesting to me is when we've talked, you've been on a lot of these press conferences, Alex, and you've heard Buzz, and tell me if you think that you get the same impression from what he's saying. He talks a lot about how they wanted to do the system that were in a way that was right by the players and the right by the way the, of, of the players' parents. It was right for their health and well-being and their spirit and all the kinds of buzzwords that, that Buzz likes to use. Um, and so because of that, they didn't hold um, summer workouts like they normally do in College Station. They told everyone to kind of stay home. In fact, they came back to school after classes started to congregate and start fall camp because most of the um, players are already taking online classes anyway, later than actually classes started and later than most other schools started just to get a better idea of what was going on with the virus. It, it just seems like Buzz Williams is handling the COVID pandemic and how it affects his team in the most conservative of manners. Um, so it's probably not surprising to me that they've been one of the teams that have had the most games in the sec postponed due to an outbreak. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Um, buzz is definitely taking this seriously. And, uh, you know, bef- before they had the, the initial outbreak, they, they hadn't had any issues, which I think is, 
shows the seriousness that, of what they that we taken. know of that we know that, of. that, that we know mm-hmm. of exactly um but you know the fact that they hadn't had to necessarily pause before that uh, i think is a testament to the seriousness of what they were uh taking with precaution wise and yeah i mean basically out two weeks i mean that that's that's a lot of games and so uh, it shows that they're making sure everyone is at full health. There's not a chance that more guys, players, coaches, other staff members get infected. And so, yeah, you know, that that's that's the right thing to do. And, you know, hope, hopefully this is the only time that they, they deal with these issues. The Aggies have five games that they need to make up, including the, November, uh, the January 20th game at Vanderbilt that was postponed because of, of positive tests in the Commodore program. I, I, they can't make up five games, can they? Yeah, I, I don't I think, think so. it's going to be super hard. You know, that that's, that's going to be interesting. I mean, I guess in theory they could. You know, the football team kind of ran into a pickle because they literally ran out of time. And, you know, you look ahead, well, yeah. they've got, what, five games left? And so, you know, you really got to cross your fingers that, you know, one of these other teams doesn't have an issue. We, um, it, 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 from the looks of it, it looks like a has got the, the last weekend of the regular season off. Like, that's their bye week. So you could for sure play one of those games. Now, the other question I have is, if you can only play, we'll say, two or three of the five games, <laughs> which of the two or three are you going to play? Because if you're A&M, you probably want to play Vanderbilt twice compared to Florida or Arkansas. Sure. Well, I don't – yeah. And that's probably going to be left up to the SEC because they are going to have to do the the scheduling Tetris for all these different teams that have had um, uh, things affected because of the pandemic and and needing to make up games that are um, postponed. But, yeah, I mean, we're coming up on it. The SEC tournament is March 10th. They basically have a month – to not only play the remaining, what you say, five, one, two, three, four, five, five games, but then to make up five more games on top of that. And here, here's my thought. Yes, I know as an A and M fan, um, you, you, I, I'm certainly not going to call you an A and M fan. You're a, you're an intrepid journalist, but you are someone who went to A and M, so you know the pulse of of the A and M fandom. Um, that, yeah, I think most people would want to have those two Vanderbilt games, because you would think those would necessarily be wins for A&M, but I, I don't know if it doesn't serve Buzz Williams okay to just not play the games this year. It, it's already been established that this is a rebuilding year um, by not necessarily direct things that anyone in the program has said, but Williams has not minced words in the fact that it's taken a long time for this team to develop. They're already behind the eight ball because of scheduling issues and getting started in this COVID season. They have a really young team that needs to develop. A lot of these players can return with an extra year because of, again, what the NCAA legislation was prior to the pandemic. So do the games really need to be made up? I I, I don't think they do. Uh, Yes. You might get two more wins on your, on your record, but what is, it's not going to, I mean, this team isn't going to make the NCAA tournament. It's not going to – I mean, the only way that they would be able to is to make a run through the SEC tournament, and they're already going to get a shot at that anyway. So what – honestly, they're they're not going to win most of those games. It's not going to affect their seeding. Why play them? Yeah, I mean, uh, I I hear you. And, you know, the season isn't necessarily a lost cause yet, but like you said, I mean, it's a total uphill battle to make the postseason tournament. This is a a season where – this is a development season. This is a freebie right. development season that you never, ever, ever will ever get again, cross your fingers, that everyone you get in your roster can come back. Yeah, there's going to be a national champion this year, but other than that, it's it's kind of sort of in a weird way like the season didn't happen. And it'll be also another interesting question along the same lines of how many of these players, these seniors, are going to try to come back and use that extra year? Because as of now, I don't think Savion Flag. And uh, who are who are who are seniors this year? And that I'm now that I'm kind of spitballing uh, Quentin off. Jackson. Quentin Jackson. Um, some of these guys who are seniors. Marfo. How many of them are are going to come back? Marfo. Um, th- how many of them 
would come back, how many of them? So we got J.J. Chandler, Savion Flag, Quentin Jackson, and then Kevin Marvo as your is your graduate right, transfer. JJ they have six guys coming in next season, so that's gonna be a lot of players on the roster. But I don't necessarily see J.J. Chandler, Savion Flag, Quentin Jackson, or Kevin Marfo um, making it in the NBA draft or, or even getting a, a look. So unless your dream is to go play overseas. Why not come back? And then also, but then does Buzz, will, will Buzz Williams have them back? Yeah, I mean, that that's going to be something interesting to follow kind of as the season ends and, you know, they, they move on to postseason and off season. You know, you, you said it. No, none of these guys necessarily have NBA prospects. You know, Savion entered the draft, what was it, right after Kennedy got let go and ended up coming back and... You know, Savion. Savion's a good player, but you know, he's he's not NBA draft. And basically, caliber. since he went out and tried to uh, test the waters, then his his stats have been worse. I mean, he hasn't been bad, but that was a great season that he tried to test the waters off of. Probably his best um, at at A and M, and he hasn't been have put up quite the same numbers as he did those two years. Right. Year. You know, I. I think I think he's been used a lot differently too. Um, you know, when Kennedy was there, he he was their scorer, and you know, uh, he hasn't necessarily been the guy they go through a hundred percent of the time, kind of like that he was the that final stretch when, in Kennedy's last year. But yeah, I mean, his numbers are down. Um, maybe he's more of a complete player now, um, but still, uh, he he's not. He's not necessarily an NBA draft caliber player either. So that that will be interesting to follow, kind of how w- when the season ends, what these guys end up doing, how Buzz manages that. You know, he loves Quentin Jackson. Uh, he seems to like Savion. I mean, he brought in Kevin Marfa for this last year. a doesn't necessarily have a, a big guy that they can lean into, and so – yeah, I, it will be interesting who comes back, why they come back, what the situation is, and you know how they kind of fit into the puzzle next year. Um, Buzz has got a pretty talented class coming in. He he's really keen on these young guys. He's played the freshman a ton, and you know one guy we haven't even seen is Cassius McNeely. I mean, he he's supposed to be one of AM's top players, if not the top player, and. He hasn't been seen for two years because he had to miss last year for the injury, and he's sitting out this year because of COVID reasons. So, yeah, it'll be interesting what happens. Sure, sure. Well, before we sign off here, Alex, this is going to be a, a little bit of an abbreviated My Aggie Nation podcast because they're, you know, uh, other than softball kicking off this weekend, which is always a, a good sign of the season, there's, there's not a whole lot – percolating in Aggie land right now. Uh, what, what, what do you want to talk about? What, what's been, what's been bugging your mind lately as terms of Aggie sports and, and, and picking at your brain? Hmm. You know, we, I kind of want to go back to the recruiting stuff because, ah. uh, you know, A&M kind of had a, it was an anticlimactic finish to their 21 class, but I'll say this. The way they finished their 21 class in December, you know, signing guys like Bryce Foster and then, you know, getting the LJ Johnson signing uh, coupled with, you know, the finish, the, the, the actual football season, winning the Orange Bowl, that has really built some serious momentum for A&M's 2022 class. And they've got they've got five pretty solid commits right now. You know, Malik Sela. He's a top 50 player out of Katy High School. They got the big quarterback commitment last week from Connor Wigman. He's Bridgeland High School playing for former a Consolidated coach David Raffield. Um, he may be a better baseball player than football player, and he's going to be playing two sports at AM. and And, you know, they get a couple of guys out of Dickinson High School, got that Jalen Weidermeyer connection. And then that last guy, Hunter Erb, he's not ranked by – 24 7 ratings i'm sure he'll get a bump whenever they come out with their new rankings but you know the momentum is there for a&m and you know that that's kind of big for them especially when you you think about texas they just hired steve sarkeesian 
you know, winning that battle over LJ Johnson down the stretch, LJ, it seemed like he was going one way and then another and going back and forth, you know, landing him over Texas was a big win for the Aggies. And the fact that they've been able to maintain their own momentum while, you know, Texas is trying to regroup and they're, they're kind of getting that new coach, that, that new car smell, uh, all gas, no brakes. Isn't that Sark's deal? New, new coach who dis? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, a has got some serious momentum. Oh, and, you know, here's a random thing, Travis. Uh, it sounds like Devon Chain is going to make his track debut this weekend uh, for the a track team I at, apologize. At Arkansas. Yes, I apologize. a track is going on right now. And not only is it going on right now, but they they ha- might be featuring. And, I, and I'm starting on a little bit of a feature about this, so I don't want to get too much into it because this could be a podcast for the future. But they are featuring a freshman in – uh, a Ting Mu, who might could leave A and M as one of the most decorated track athletes that A and M has had in its very very rich track history. I mean, the sky is the absolute limit for this uh, uh, athlete, and by all indications, the people I talk to, there's plenty of people that might be expecting her to break a world record in an Aggie uniform. So, um, yes, Devon A Chain uh, going to run some track, but also. Um, I'm not necessarily a huge track person, but even if you're not a track person, you need to know that name because it's going to be up there with some of the, probably the best A&M athletes there are around. For sure. You know, she has had a terrific start. I've gotten to catch up and read some of her accolades, the weekly accolades. And I think Rich Kroom, our, our part-time guy, he, uh, he's been out at some of the track stuff chronicling kind of her early endeavors and yeah she's off to a uh, pun intended fast start stop is that really (laughs) is that really how we're gonna end the podcast maybe i'm just just so so disappointed right you brought me on this is what you get this is on me this is on me you're go (laughs) fine you're demoted back to quality control analyst everyone that is the great Alex Miller. Um, thanks, Alex, for filling in for Zach Taylor. Uh, you are you you are equally as bearded and equally as insightful. Um, thanks everyone for listening this week. We we don't really have an interview this week. We just kind of wanted to break down everything that's going on because uh, it's a little bit crazy right now. But we'll be back with more interviews, more Zach Taylor, and more My Aggie Nation podcast in the weeks to come. Thanks everyone for listening. It seems like every day, everything just has a way, the way it must have seems. But if we don't watch what we're doing, our hearts will get ruined by silly things. Good love ain't needs a girl, we know that's true. And if we want to keep it, we gotta watch everything that we do. Make sure you're sticking with me. Don't want-